All right. That would, um, I'm, I'm sure it's got you guys thinking about the, the toughest opponents that you face. So, so Graham, let's start with you. Who, who have you gone for? Well, when I was asked the question, Dave, I, I, I started to do it and then I just came back to this. I just picked the, the, the best team I'd ever played against. This, for me, was the best team that's never won a World Cup. This was 82, the Brazilian team. And when you look at the midfield, Falcao, Socrates, um, the boy Junior never gets mentioned as a great in Brazilian terms, but believe me, he was. And then arguably the best player I ever played against, Zico. Serginho was a fabulous player. Um, Cerezo, who, who ended up going to Santoria after I, I left there, he, you know, I played against him in the European Cup final when he was playing for Roma. And this was a team that, I mean, this was how you imagine Brazilian football to be. They're just on the front foot all the time. And it's the only game of football I've ever played in where I felt within the first five minutes, we, we don't have a chance here. We just don't have a chance. I can remember we played them in 82 in Seville. And you go out to warm up. And Seville's one of the hottest cities in Spain in the summer. Inland, no breeze, stinking hot. So we go out to warm up, come back in. You're covered in sweat. You put your head under the cold shower. And you go back out. And you're lined up. I'm the captain. I'm lined up. To my right is a, a linesman, a referee, and another linesman. Socrates, and then all of them. Now I look down to the left where, you know, Scottish and Pili Wally Scotsman. He's, he's white-skinned, freckles. Looks like he's just played 90 minutes. And I'm thinking, we don't look in great shape. And then I look to the right, and I can see Socrates and the rest of them that don't have a bead of sweat on the strip. And you're thinking... We've got big problems today, and that's how I found out. We made the mistake of scoring first, and then they just went to another level. It was like, you know, going from second gear in your car to fifth. They were a fantastic team, just threats from everywhere, threats from everywhere. Graham, was the was was there no one? I know I know you picked that Brazil uh, team, and it was a very famous team. But was there anyone sort of where you come up against in Italy? I know you mentioned Zico there, but I mean, would Maradona have been playing there? Was it was he closer? You know, were you thinking about these teams maybe yeah. compromising, yeah, getting well, individual players in? Jamie, in in the eighties, you know, it was a bit like what the Premier League is now, where everybody, unless you can go to Barcelona, Real Madrid. Maybe Bayern Munich you would choose before coming to the Premier League. But, um, you know, all the big players were in Italy in the 80s. And, you know, I was 31 when I went there. I just won the European Cup with Liverpool. And I think, you know, I really fancied, you know, the challenge. I wanted to test myself again. Um, so I went up there and I'm, I'm trying to think, again, whether I've got a selective memory or not. Or I've got, um, that normally happens every I Sunday, that. Myself, yeah, no, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to choose the worst pair from It's such a high opinion of myself. I well, had a high opinion of myself as a player. I never, I never, I don't think um, I played against anyone and thought, well, he's seen me off today. He's he's played me off the park today. No, because in those days, if you if you were up against, if you were playing a game of football and it wasn't quite working, the rules were different and you could get away with a bit more mischief in those days, to put it politely. So you could test them not just in the football sense, you can test them if you really fancied the, um, the physical aspect. Um, so there wasn't, obviously Maradona was just off the scale as well, you know, in terms of power and technique and close control, goals, the vision he saw, the vision he had, the passes he chose when, you know, whatever pitch he had and he said, it was off the scale. Um, I, I mentioned this to you, I've mentioned this to you before, you know, I, I am going back to my generation in my the football in the eighties, you know, where you were allowed to be a bit more physical. I there's only two players. Should be a quiz question, Dave. There's only two players I never managed to lay a finger on. One was English, and the other one was Zico. So they, who was the English one that I never managed to get anywhere near in terms of trying to put them off physically? You know, try to make them think twice about getting on the ball and being cute. Who was the English one? There's only two. Well, I know the answer. Dave? I know the answer. Oh, do you? Yeah, I know the answer. So we've had this yeah. conversation. Yeah, because you, you told me before, and and uh, and I'm not bored of hearing the story because it, it's Alan Ball, um, someone that 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 probably we we you know we forget the talents that we've had in this country. Oh, well, Alan Ball was was just on another planet. Just to, again, I, 
he played one or two touches. He just he didn't dwell on the ball. He couldn't make a challenge on him. He was just too cute. So I was a young man, 19, playing against him for Middlesbrough at Harrison Park. And I'm lunging into challenges. I'm going to the ground. I'm trying to catch him. We came out for the second half. He was playing for Arsenal. Came out for the second half. And the whole second half was him going, woof, woof, to me. And I chased him down some part for 45 minutes. And he never, he never, I never, ever put a finger on him. What did he, he do, kids. Graham? It was a growling like a dog. <laughs> and woof, woof. <laughs> That's how you got up this morning. Uh, Yes. <laughs> Graham, for, for, for our younger viewers who perhaps won't remember and haven't seen Zico, how would you compare him to a modern day footballer? What, what were his talents? Well, I, I, again, another story, Dave. But at the end of the first year, they picked a top in the team. A top, a top 11 players to play against the, the league champions who won Serie A. And it, and it was Verona. So they picked 11 players, we turned up, all the top men were there. Now I'm playing the same team as Zico, and I'm standing behind him on three or four occasions, and the ball's coming out of the sky or it's being passed to him. I don't have to concentrate on the ball. I'm looking where he's going to pass the ball. On four or five occasions, he's, he's made a completely different choice than the one I would have made. So that's, that's the point I'd like to make. That the, the picture he saw on his head, it wasn't just about making that pass, it was about... What, when I've made that pass, what happens after that? So this is what separates the true superstars to the really good players to the average players to bang average players. Picture that All right, Jamie, you've um, you've had some uh, well, you've had some great games in, in Europe, playing for England as well. So you could have picked from a whole galaxy of players yourself. Let's have a look at your one, two, eleven, Jamie. There it is. Um, talk us through that then. What uh, what were the the easy decisions, if you like, Jamie, for you? Well, I think the easiest ones are possibly the fullbacks and uh, come up against them in 2005 in the Champions League final. And they weren't just the best fullbacks of their generation. I actually I actually believe they're the two best fullbacks of all time. In some ways, I don't think there's many arguments possibly with that, uh, with Paolo Maldini and, and Cafu. Uh, Goalkeeper-wise, I, I picked Buffon. Uh, born on the same day as him, scored against him, so it always gives me a chance to get that story in. But uh, he was a great, great goalkeeper. I think certainly think the best of his generation. Centre-back-wise, uh, Desai, uh, I don't think Desai possibly in the Premier League showed uh, possibly what he'd shown before, maybe certainly at AC Milan. But in certain games against Liverpool, it was like men against boys, really, when he really wanted to turn it on. And John Terry... Uh, for me, has been the best Premier League centre back certainly in my time watching football. There's plenty of foreign other centre backs I could have put in there, but I think uh, I wanted to put John Terry in there, get a Premier League, you know Premier League player in there, and I think he's been as good as anyone. I think the midfield in terms of Xavi and Iniesta, I think picks itself. I, I think they what they did for Barcelona, absolute superstars, the two of them. I mean, I wanted Roy Keane probably a little bit more central, more of the holding position there. So he'd, he'd be centre. Now, I was actually thinking what other players you'd come against. you think of maybe like a Pirlo who's a completely different player to Roy Keane in that position. But I think what Roy Keane would give you in that position, sitting in front of a back four, organising the energy, challenges, playing from there. And then I look at that front three, and I think certainly anyone from my generation, it would be Messi and Ronaldo or one other. And that one other for me would be Thierry Henry, who I think is the greatest Premier League player of all time and certainly my toughest opponent. And I think that Arsenal team, he played in, a, you know, the Invincibles and two or three years around that, that would certainly be the toughest opponent I played and that's certainly at home and abroad. So, yes, very fortunate to come up against some of the, you know, the best players uh, in the world at that time through, you know, the success we had at, at different seasons uh, with Liverpool. Was it the pace and physicality of Thierry as well as the skill that made him such a difficult player to face? Yes, because Graham mentioned something before. When you're not having a great day as a player, you know, probably 20, 30 years ago, you could leave one on someone physically. And that listen, that was still part of my game. Even in, in, in the modern day, you have to be really careful in terms of cards. But you, you think, well, OK, if someone's got better ability than me, OK, can I, you know, rattle them early on, put a really tough challenge on, will they fancy it? The problem with Thierry Henry was when you're actually getting the tunnel, certainly with that Arsenal team as well, 
everyone was six foot two. Everyone had shoulders out here. And it was almost, you look at the physical battle, you, you couldn't knock them off the stride. Really. They were too physically strong for you at different times. And, and as I said, Graham mentioned before about uh, the Brazil game, where he knew within five minutes they couldn't go on and win the game, really. It was going to be tough. At times, you had that feeling in the tunnel with Arsenal when you just come up alongside them and the sheer size. And you know how great they were as, as players, but sometimes you have to stand alongside someone to really understand you know, the sheer physicality of that team. And even someone like Bearcamp was a huge man as well. So that's why I always choose those, uh, certainly that team uh, of Arsene Wenger and Arsenal as my toughest opponent. Question from Lawrence on Twitter, Jamie. How close did Gary Neville get to your uh, toughest 11? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly if I was doing Premier League 11, I don't know why Gary I'm Neville would be really I don't know close. Why I'm no, but uh, <laughs> I think there's a fella there who plays for Liverpool now thinks he's going to take that mantle uh, from Gary. And I'm sure he was, he was a young lad watching Monday Night Football when I, I said those immortal words of no one wants to grow up and be a Gary Neville. And... and Looks like Trent Alexander-Arnold's proved me wrong and certainly Gary Neville wrong in terms of actually ability-wise. Because I think in a, in a few years' time when we're talking about Premier League 11s of all time, I think uh, it'll be the lad from Liverpool, not the lad from Manchester. Yeah, what a player he is. Um, uh, Graham, we've got a few questions on this. We were talking about um, Spurs' decision earlier to overturn their, their, um, their furloughing. That leaves just Newcastle and Norwich in the Premier League as having furloughed non-playing staff. Do you think there'll be now more pressure on those two clubs? I know they're they're very different in terms of their business models. Oh yeah, enormous. Um, you know, they're not Spurs with their turnover. I would imagine somewhere near five hundred million. Liverpool the same. When you look at Newcastle and you look at um, Norwich, they don't have the same numbers. Don't know the same same strength financially going forward. You know the people of Newcastle. I think will bring the people of Newcastle, not outside. You know, Newcastle is a proper city, proper football city. Um, you know, saltly earth type individuals that live up there. I'll tell you exactly how it is. And I don't think they'll be slow in putting their own their own club under pressure. Norwich, All right, Graham. No, possibly the same. 